So we're here in Shropshire with Andrew Williamson. So Andrew, tell us a little bit about your farm. So we uh, farm about 900 acres here in, near Bridge North. It's a combinable crop farm. We're growing a combination of wheat, orchard rape, winter barley, spring barley, oats and spring beans. And we've got a little bit of grassland as well and also the whole farm is in a higher level environmental scheme. So you, you know, you were brought up here, you went away to university. What, what drew you back to the farm? I think I always knew in my heart of hearts I wanted to become a farmer. I was interested from a very young age, but equally so I wanted to get away. I wanted to go and see other things. I ended up going to university because I was relatively good at what I did and I didn't want to go to agricultural college either. So eventually I decided I'd got to come back and make a decision and I came back and, in 1999 and um, told my dad I'd give it five years. If I still liked it, I'd stay. If not, I was going somewhere else and, um, and I'm still here now. So. And what do you think, you know, next five years and stuff, what do you think the biggest challenges you're going to face here? I think our biggest challenge is going to be make sure that we can build a resilient business based around um, cost of production, but also based around rotation. A real challenge for us, from, certainly from your point of view, is the loss of actives we've got. There's going to be more challenges. We're going to have to be able to do things that we are now with less, I think, or we're going to have to think for different, uh, different solutions and, and look for different alternatives. There's lots of things we're trying to do, and actually I think the future is quite exciting, to be honest. Change isn't always a bad thing, is it? No, no, I think it is, and, and we need to be sort of... We can look back on history of the last 10 or 15 years and we've, we've gone backwards in some cases and, and we need to learn from those lessons. Things like we control, we need to learn, we need to be a bit more proactive, we can't just keep doing the same thing year on year, we need to find out what works and what doesn't and change things around a little bit. And that's, what, that's really what makes farming interesting, mm -hmm. the fact that you can do different things and it's, one year is not the same to the next. It also makes it rather frustrating as well because you think you've cracked it and then you do that the next year and it doesn't work. So yeah, there's lots of things there. Yeah. So we've just seen you um, spray off your, your barley because of the ryegrass in here. So what issues have you got with weeds on the farm? So the issues of weeds on the farm are quite diverse. We've got a mixed population of grass weeds, ryegrass, brome grass, both soft and sterile brome grasses, and we've got some black grass. And part of the reason why we've been spraying this barley off today is to even up the, the senescence of it, but also the barley, the uh, ryegrass has been sprayed off because we've got an area in this field where we've got fallow which we left because we couldn't control the ryegrass in the preceding wheat crop. So we were never going to control in the barley. And so we just need to finish it off because otherwise it's going to get seed return and we don't want to get seed return. So what strategies are you incorporating, you know, as well as just spraying off? So the main, we've got sort of three pronged approach to grass weed control, which we've taken from the, the Eastern, trying to learn lessons from there. Firstly, we will um, identify what weeds we've got and which species we've got and where, and we try and make sure and record which species we've got where, so we've got a record, and then we can use that to tailor our future programs and make sure we're targeting the right weed. And then we'll also um, rogue all the fields, walk them, pull them out if they're, if they're hand rogable. If they're not hand rogable, then we'll go out and we'll spray them out either with a knapsack or a, or a handheld sprayer, or, or if they're big patches, we'll spray it with the, with the main sprayer and I just, I'm prepared to take out large areas if necessary because we just do not want to get any seed return. And do you monitor the progress over years to see how you're doing, yeah, the we strategy? Yeah, we've just sort of started doing that now. So this year in the Rogan situation, we've started logging how much time we spend on each field to give us an idea of cost as well. Yeah. And then we can allocate that to that field. And also it's a better record rather than trying to remember what you saw in each field. So for example, we've got some fields where we've got black grass, but we may have only pulled four plants out of a, out of a 30 hectare field but we've still got some black grass there. So, but, but then if we pulled out, if we spent 10 hours in there roguing and most it's ryegrass, then we need to tailor our programme towards ryegrass as opposed to black grass. But it's those little odd plants that you, we, we find from roguing, which we mustn't miss. So do you incorporate a zero tolerance strategy? Yeah, I would say we have a zero tolerance strategy to, to it, but we have to choose your crop because some crops, like wheat is better than others, but you, you can't have a zero tolerance on this barley. This barley is quite dirty and barley, winter barley in particular, is becoming one of our dirtiest crops because of the, the lack of chemistry post-emergence. So we accept that we're going to get some grass weeds in there, but we know it's going to orchard rape, and we can hopefully control it within the orchard rape. So you tell you your rotation as well? Yeah, it's all about rotation as well, and we'll pick fields where we used to have a very fixed rotation where we said it went, it went X, Y, Z, but now it's, our rotation is built around about this time of year, and we'll pick if a certain field is dirty and it's supposed to be going into wheat, 
or something else, we'll change it and we put into spring crop and things like that. So you can adapt? Adapt, yeah. We have to be flexible because of the weeds are, so we need to be more, as flexible as they are. Excellent. So Andrew, we're here in your yen field that you've entered this year. You've been doing yen for three years now, haven't you? What's your approach to yen over the past few years? So our key approach to yen is to try and learn what we're doing wrong, really. And we want to do it on a whole field approach. We're not interested in doing small, taking little tiny pockets of really good parts of the field. We need to make sure we can perform across the whole field. So it's quite, a, it's quite holistic. We're trying to get a, a healthy, healthy soil to create a healthy crop to get, get healthy people as well. So the whole thing is just moving forward to get the health right in the crop and the soil. And would you say you've learned any one thing from yen or a whole series of things? So the main learning from yen really that we've seen is, is biomass and getting a, a bigger crop. And one of our failings is we get a low heads per metre squared normally, but we get big heads. But even though you, we now find out that no matter how, if you've got a small head number, you can't compensate, you can't get enough grains per metre squared, and that's ultimately what we're trying to get. Yeah. So we're drawing things like we're using more nitrogen early on, and we're also starting to look at using biostimulants as well to try and just, again, trying to keep that crop healthy as, po as healthy as possible. It can cope with different situations, cope with heat, stress, drought, stress, all that sort of thing. So we're just trying to move things forward on a more of a holistic approach, really. Great. Well, it's looking good now, so best of luck for this season. Yeah, well, hopefully it'll be OK. We'll see. <laughs> So Andrew, we're in this uh, crop of beans, really nice crop of beans. How long have you been growing beans on the farm for? Uh, we've been growing beans regularly on the farm for about four years now. And the main reason why that is because we started to change our rotation. So right. we started bringing more spring cropping, whereas four years ago we would have been completely blocked winter cropping, okay. cereals and oilseed rape. Um, and the problem from that, the grass weeds were getting a bit out of control. So we brought the spring cropping back in to help with grass weed control. Okay, so the crop looks great. How did you establish it? So this was established following a cover, put an overwinter cover crop on following a crop of winter wheat um, of a mix of spring beans, all sorts of things, winter oats, bursum clover, vetch, buckwheat, things like that, a very diverse mix. Um, and then we went forward with um, light cultivation in the, in the spring yep. and then drilled it with a virus that drill. Okay, and the reason for putting the cover crop in? Uh, the cover crop is two things. We're trying to improve, improve the soil health. We're trying to keep something living and growing in the soil at the time, a living root. Okay. Um, it also helps with, you can see from this field, there's, a, there's a quite a large valley where we used to have two separate fields and we get a problem with soil erosion, water erosion to that valley. And we found from experience if we can get a cover crop established well in sort of mid to late August, then we can get some good root structure and we don't get the soil erosion. So obviously we're keeping the water on the field, we're keeping the nutrition in the field, we're keeping all everything else that we want to do and most importantly keeping the soil in the field as well. Okay, excellent. Okay, Andrew, so um, you mentioned that you're trying to do everything with a bit more attention to detail than possibly going forwards using more decision support tools. So what is it that you're using here? So yeah, so the moment we're using an end tester for helping with our nitrogen strategies. We've been using precision agriculture for the last 10 years, including an end sensor to manage the amount of variable nitrogen we put on. But we're looking to use the tester now to see if we can uh, manipulate the timings and make sure we get the timings correct and also the application amount. So now, before we go and put fertiliser on, we go out to the field, we'll take a sample, tell us how much nitrogen is in the crop and how much is actually required, because obviously it depends on cl climate and weather. The nitrogen we put on beforehand may have been taken up, it may not have been, we may need to go early, we may need to go later. So it's just get, trying to fine tune those decisions rather than just saying, I'm going to put so much on on this date and I'm going to put so much on the next date and just sort of make it a bit more flexible and more fluid. So how have you used that this season? At what timings have you taken them this season? So we, we normally put a, a flat rate, base rate on to start with, just to wait the crop up out of winter. And then we use the end tester before the second and third dressings to make sure we get in the right timing and we put the right amount on. Um, and we're also looking to move forward to tie it in with the end sensor so we can go to a particular point in the field, take a reading, and then that'll tell me that I need to put on a certain amount of nitrogen. And we take the end sensor to that same point and tell the end sensor at this point you need to put this amount of nitrogen on and then it'll find all the corresponding points around the field and put the same amount on rather than put an average so that's one way forward we're moving as well but we're not quite sure how it's going to pan out quite yet so andrew obviously with brexit around the corner and all the uncertainty that that'll bring to the industry how's that affecting your business yeah well brexit is is the great 
known unknown, isn't it? And we don't know what's going to happen. And, and it's just, I see it as a catalyst for change and we make sure that our business is resilient for the future, both economically and rotationally and everything. So we're looking at different things where we are uh, farming policy. We share all our machines with a, with a neighbour. It gives us a bit more chance to reduce our cost of production. And we're currently the drill we stood by now is, has been sold. We're changing that. And the, the share of machinery really helps us from an economic and social point of view. It's better for the bottom line, but it's also better for our morale. It's better for our interaction with other people. Farming can be quite isolating, and it's good to have another person to talk to, to bounce ideas off and just work that way. So it's all hopefully will be much better in the future, no matter what comes out of Brexit, if anything. <laughs>